You're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello, Book Talk Today family, and welcome back to another episode of the Book Talk Today podcast. My name is Orn, I am your host, and in today's podcast, we are joined by Oliver Below. Oliver is an author and journalist. He's published multiple books, including The Financial Exposé, Moneyland, a Sunday Times bestseller, and his most recent book, Butler to the World, How Britain Serves Oligarchs, Gangsters and Kleptocrats. And I wanted to have Oliver on the podcast about a year ago to discuss his previous book, Moneyland, um, and he reached out to me and said that he's writing a new book. So we organised this podcast. And it was a really interesting conversation, especially with what is happening at the moment with Britain specifically pressing sanctions against Russian oligarchs and I know Roman Abramovich is one that's in the news right now um, as being a individual high profile individual that is being sanctioned by the UK government and in our conversation we discussed how Britain became butler to the world with the decline of the British Empire in other countries and how it served others in and hiding money and becoming a vessel for international money laundering as well. It's a very interesting conversation and I really appreciate Oliver coming onto the podcast to discuss his book. Just a quick side note, unfortunately the audio on my side in this podcast wasn't the best. I'm not too sure what happened but it's something that we're going to be monitoring for future podcast episodes as well. I just wanted to let you know just in case you're listening to this and wondering why the audio on my side wasn't the best. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to the podcast. Every week we release a podcast with an author to discuss their book and the ideas and principles inside of it. We have some really exciting podcasts lined up over the coming weeks and we're starting to trend really highly in different countries all around the world in the rankings as well. So the best way that you can support this channel is to subscribe, whether you're listening to this on Apple, Spotify or YouTube. My recommendation is the best way that you can support the channel is head over to our YouTube channel, Book Talk Today and subscribe over there. That is the free and easy way for you to support the channel. Thank you for listening to this podcast again, and I really hope you enjoyed this episode with Oliver. Oliver, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thanks very much for having me on. You're welcome. And this topic is one that I've read about quite extensively, having read your previous book, Moneyland, as well. I think it's a very interesting topic because I don't think many people know about the depths in which Britain is uh, infiltrated into this into this sphere. So, uh, yeah, your new book, Butler to, the, Butler to the World, is a very interesting book. And I think before we get into some of the topics of it, I think it'd be great just to give a, a background behind how Britain became uh, Butler to the World. Yeah, you make a really good point about how this is not something that many British people associate with us, by which I mean enabling financial crime, generally helping some of the world's worst people to get away with almost anything. You know, I think our... Actually, I don't think it's just something that British people don't associate with us. I'm not sure it's more broadly associated globally. I think our sort of international reputation is based on, you know, Harry Potter, um, Ed Sheeran, you know, that kind of sort of soft power, you know, middle brow soft power, I think is, you know, is, is pretty is pretty much our, our, our brand. And the idea that all the time there is this sort of separate, you know, equally significant, if not more significant money moving industry for crooks and thieves is something that doesn't get nearly enough attention. Um, I, so a bit, little bit about me, I'm from Wales, but I moved to Russia when I finished university in 1999. And just because I'd always been fascinated by Eastern Europe, it always it just struck me as where interesting things happened. And I'd spent all my time as a student traveling around in, in the holidays in sort of I'd earn some money, then I'd go to like Bulgaria or, or Croatia or wherever and just wander around. And, and, gen- and I read all these travel books. I was just fascinated by it. So I moved to Russia and lived there and I needed to have a job. So I started working as a journalist. It wasn't really a deliberate plan. Um, and I gradually realized that the sort of very naive idea I'd had in my mind that Russia would be this, you know, democratizing place, you know, that I would be there to witness the arrival of sort of freedom and democracy and everything, um, that this was a little bit wider the mark. 
um, and that that very much wasn't what I was seeing. In fact, I arrived in Russia about two weeks after Vladimir Putin became prime minister in 1999. So I've never been to Russia without him being either prime minister or president. Um, Mm. And gradually, you know, I mean, as a journalist, I wrote about the war in Chechnya. I wrote about human rights abuses. I wrote all sorts of things like that. And I gradually became increasingly sort of discombobulated by this weird mismatch that I used to get. I would go to, you know, a rural Russian village to, on a story or to write about something. And there would be a village that was, you know, falling apart. There would be maybe two people left in this whole village. Everyone else had, had died or, or, or emigrated. And there'd be like two old women scraping a living. And then I would come into the middle of Moscow and the middle of Moscow would be just boutique, 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 like a Bentley showroom, Maserati showroom. It was just totally bonkers, this sort of the degree in which Moscow <coughs> was, the, particularly the middle of Moscow was, you know, world class metropolis with every shop, everything you could dream of. And then really not very far from Moscow, you were in in a place that appeared to be going backwards really quite fast. Um, and I'd come across corruption in that people shook me down for bribes because that's what happens when you're in Russia. You try and leave the country, people hit you for a bribe, you try to come in, you try to get into mm. a car, you do anything. You, you know, there are just, just pre- predatory police officers everywhere. So I knew about corruption, but I hadn't really put two and two together that this incredible inequality and then this you know, corruption was sort of two parts of the same story. And I didn't really put that together until the Ukrainian revolution of 2014, when I realised that, you know, this public up, up, outrage and uprising had been about corruption and, and inequality, and inequality and corruption were the same issue. And and then as soon as I started looking at corruption, I, I very quickly realised that essentially you can't write about corruption in Ukraine or Russia or anywhere without talking about the UK, because the money always comes through the UK. It doesn't matter what the scam is. There's always a British shell company or or a British law firm or a British bank or a British, you know, member of the House of Lords, whatever. There are always someone or something involved. There's always a British connection. Um, and so this is a long answer to a short question. Sorry, but anyway. No, the, why? Uh, no, but I just, I just wanted to ask you, what, why do you think that is the case? Well, like, well, where's is the, the history well, the, behind that? Well, this is the point in that because I hadn't I suppose I hadn't really thought of this as weird because I just got used to the fact there was always a British connection. And then I was having this conversation, which is where I begin the book. So I can get back to where I wanted to be with this rather long preamble. Um, I, I was having to chat with this guy, Andrew, who's an American academic, and he asked me um, he wanted to, to research the British response to specifically Chinese money laundering. Um, and he'd come with this prepared list of questions to London. And, and I think what he wanted was me to introduce him to all of my contacts. Um, you know, he wanted to know who the prosecutors were, who the police officers were, who the politicians were, who was doing the most to fight Chinese money laundering in the UK. And the more he asked me questions and the more I told him that no one's doing this, um, the more sort of he, it became almost like like like, you know, like he was in, in that, you know, um, Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. Like he kept trying to find the right password for how's he going to open this sort of magic cave with all the secrets yeah. about British money, anti-money laundering and eventually I had to say look you don't understand that doesn't happen here um, you know in America you're the policeman of the world but we don't do any of those things and then I was I was trying to come up with a phrase you know what is it that we are if you're if America's the policeman what are we and then I said we're the butler you know we're the butler we don't do those things we we don't stop them we help them and um, and anyway, he got fed up with this and decided to go and find someone less depressing to talk to. But but I <laughs> sat there in the coffee shop and I had another cup of coffee. And I thought, actually, that's a, a really interesting way of looking at it, because, you know, the, this the idea that there's always a British sort of connection to all these scams is actually really weird. Um, and so when did that happen? Like, why? Why did we become this great world class enabler of financial crime? What happened? And that's um, what I started looking into. And it all, it goes back to, you know, when you trace it back, you need, uh, it struck me that this is a, this is a, a post empire story, right? Mm. In the, in the days of the British empire, you know, Britain didn't need to, to, to enable crimes by other countries, oligarchs, you know, we, we, we did that in house, right? Um, we, we had our own oligarchs. We, we looted yeah. countries on our own account, right? That's what the empire did. It stole people's stuff and kept it. Um, 
And just like the Russian elite do now, that's what we used to do. But then a time came when we couldn't afford to do that anymore. Um, mm. But we still knew how to do it. Right. So, um, you know, so it's a bit like an aristocrat who's lost his fortune, but still knows his way around a country house. He still knows which are all the best clubs in London. He still knows what to do at Royal Ascot or whatever. So instead of being an aristocrat on his own account, he's just a butler to another aristocrat and he can show them how to do it. And that's where what Britain does. Britain's the butler to the world. It, it, it's got all the bullying skills. It just can't afford to be a bully anymore. So it just advises other other bullies in how to be a better bully, really. That's, that's, that's our national industry. And I don't think it gets nearly enough attention. Yeah, the, the history behind the transition from the decline of the empire into a facilitator is a very interesting one. And I know at the beginning of the book, you talk about how the decline of the empire and how they were sort of facilitating the trade. So the empire would then go into countries and, like you say, loot and take the things and then bring it back and facilitate trade. But then they couldn't do that anymore. But they enabled that to happen. They became an enabler rather than the person forcing the, the agenda. Yeah, I mean, in, in sort of financial services, they have this distinction between buy side and sell side. You know, buy side are the people with the money and sell side are the people who sell services to the people with the money. You know, when the British Empire went bust, we went from buy side to sell side. And and there's this, and fascinating, it is actually the same moment, you know, it, it's in which the city of London flips from being the, the engine of the British Empire to the enabling engine for everyone else. And it's when, it's during the Suez crisis, which is, you know, this sort of, totemic moment in modern British history, the moment of great national humiliation, when, you know, Britain had to back down because the Americans told us to. And, and, and you know, from that point, the British Empire was, you know, what was left of it was was doomed. Um, but it has this really interesting, little discussed sort of financial undercurrent, which is that when the British government was still attempting to, to stand up to the Americans and was attempting to maintain this bonkers military adventure in Egypt, which, I mean, if, if for those of your listeners who are not aware of this, this is when, you know, Britain and France used to own the Suez Canal and the, and the Egyptians, the uppity Egyptians, decided that since it was their canal and in their country, then, then they should own it. And, you know, and at the time, like nationalising strategically important companies was something everyone was doing. I mean, Britain had nationalised all the coal mines, the Bank of England, the steelworks, France had nationalised everything. But the idea that these Egyptians might dare to do literally the same thing that we're done was obviously beside the was absolutely beyond the pale. They they couldn't be allowed to do that. So so Britain and France they kept a bit slightly a, a little bit like Russia's been doing with Ukraine. They kept trying to come up force Egypt to give them a pretext to invade, and Egypt just kept not giving them a pretext. So so they they basically managed to persuade the Israelis to invade, and then and then invaded themselves to separate the two warring sides as if this wasn't a deranged cooked up scheme. To, to, to take over the canal and knock off the government in, in Egypt. And the Americans saw right through this instantly and were like, what on earth are you doing? Um, and they refused to support the British financially. And at the time, you know, the British economy was very weak and Sterling came under a huge amount of pressure. Um, and in order to try and maintain the British economy for that bit longer, the British government banned the use of Sterling to finance foreign trade. They said to banks, you can't use Sterling. And so the, all these banks who, who were sort of kind of limping along anyway, because because Britain was by that point a bit of a backwater, had all their, in, their their business totally cut off. They couldn't fund anything. They were about everyone was going to go bust. And um, and in, so instead of financing foreign trade with pounds, they did it with dollars. And do, there were dollars in London, a few. Some people banked their dollars in London. But it was a it was a weird thing to do because there wasn't really anything you could do with dollars in London. They were they, they belonged in the United States. Um Interestingly, the first dollars were actually Russian dollars, which the Russians didn't want to keep in America because they didn't trust them. So the Soviet Union and the city of London kind of teamed up to undercut the United States. And, and, the, and the banks realised almost instantly that this was an incredible thing to be able to do, because at that time, there were some quite severe restrictions from the Americans on what you could do with dollars. They, they, they really limited, say, what interest rates you could charge and things like that and, you know, and, and how you could move your dollars and what you could do with them. Whereas obviously in London, there were no restrictions at all because it was London. You could do what you liked. And um, and so essentially they, they still had the old connections of the British Empire. You know, there were still the old the old arteries of the empire still existed. It's just that there was no you know blood, as it were, no sterling to flow down them anymore. So instead of trans, instead of sterling running down the pipes of the old British Empire, they just pumped dollars down them. And suddenly these offshore dollars, they call them euro dollars, 
which were as valuable as dollars, but with none of the limitations on them, were, were just this astonishingly liberating thing to do. It was money that, with no restrictions, which had never existed before. And, and this is the invention of what the bankers called offshore. Um, offshore hadn't existed before. Everything was onshore before that. There were always some countries' regulations in, on what you were doing with your money. And suddenly, because they were using American money in London, there were no British restrictions. And because it was in London, there were no American restrictions. And it, and it was, you know, this, it was the moment which capital was set free. And previously, you know, they had been quite firm democratic controls on capital deliberately to try and prevent the sort of excesses which led to the Great Depression and the Second World War and things had been quite, you know, governments had tried very hard to prevent money being able to break free. But, but the City of London said, well, no, we're going to set it free because there's profits for us and profits for the, for the, for the money's owners. And that was the moment. That's the moment when butlering takes off. It's, and, it, and it's the moment when the British Empire sort of enters terminal decline. Suez, before that, you know, Britain still had a world class asset in the Suez Canal. After that, it didn't. But then it had a world class asset in the offshore dollar markets. And, and, and it sort of. It, it took a while for anyone to really notice how significant this invention was, because the Bank of England, who kind of let it happen, kind of kept it to themselves for a while. But, you know, by the early 1960s, you know, the market was worth about five billion dollars a year. By the end of the 1960s, it was worth about 40 billion dollars a year. This is just the offshore dollar market. And then now that market's probably worth about three trillion dollars a year. It's the biggest market in the world. And it is the market. There is no such thing as as a non offshore dollar anymore. Um, you know, so essentially, the Bank of England was the fixed point from which, you know, the interest of money and capital managed to break and destroy um, the, stri- the s- restrictions put in place by democracy and, and people, which is pretty. Dark, does does the Bank of, yeah, does the Bank of England oversee the euro dollar? Like, where was the euro dollar invented? Because I thought it was a really interesting concept that you mentioned in the book that they just no, invented. No, one, no, no, no one oversaw it at all. I mean, that's the point of it because it's. If you had a dollar in the US, it was restricted and regulated by the Federal Reserve. But if you had a dollar in London, it wasn't regulated or restricted by anyone. So that was what was amazing about it, because it both was and wasn't a dollar. And this is this is really, really hard to explain because because money doesn't yeah. work like this anymore. Um, you know, we've got so used to the fact that money just goes where it wants and does what it wants. that It's really hard to get your head around the fact that there was a time when that isn't how money worked. And the invention of money that was totally free was this astonishing revolutionary invention it was a you know a brand new thing so so the metaphor i use in the book to try and explain it is that and i read about this once in a, in a history of northern ireland and i can't remember where i read about it but i i did read about it i promise and if anyone listening to this knows where this story comes from please get in touch and tell me because i can't find it anywhere and i've looked but there was supposedly a farmer whose farm crossed the border between the republic and northern ireland during the troubles and he built himself a petrol tank, which went underneath the border, right? So it was a very large petrol tank and it had an, an access point in the north and an access point in the Republic. And he would fill it with petrol. And wherever the price was lowest, he would fill, fill it up. And wherever it was highest, he would take it out. Now, the, the petrol was both was and wasn't in Ireland or in Northern Ireland, sorry, in the Republic of Ireland or in Northern Ireland at any one time. It only became the other one or the other when he decided he wanted to do something with it. And and it didn't matter to him where the price was lower and where the price was higher. He made a profit either way. Um, and, and it was a little bit like this with the euro dollar market, because essentially what, what they managed to do was they created a, a new form of dollar and and where you could charge higher interest rates in London and than were available in New York. So you could make more money in London. But if the situation was reversed, you still made money the other way around. It, it, it's like it was a, essentially New York and London became a single place, but just happened to be regulated by two different governments and the money moved freely backwards and forwards. And then this idea, the idea that you can move money between countries and just take advantage of wherever it's treated better, the equivalent of taking advantage of wherever the petrol is more expensive. They then do this in lots of places. You know, so. So the birth of the British Virgin Islands, is a, which is a, a, a whole chapter in the book, and, a, and a, you know the British Virgin Islands is, is today you know the most prolific and important uh, sort of shell company tax haven in the world. Um, 
but it didn't used to be. That's an invention. It was invented by in a sort of joint venture by some lawyers from America and 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 Britain uh, in in the in the nineteen seventies and eighties. And before that, the British the only reason the British Virgin Islands aren't independent is because they essentially they were too poor to be independent. They were the poorest place in the British Empire, but they did have a couple of lawyers, and the lawyers were really keen on earning some fees. And so they they created shell companies for Americans, and these turned out to be incredibly useful. And so they spread around the world, and now they're used by absolutely everyone. And the principle of this is, is the same of what was being done between London and New York as being done between the British Virgin Islands and New York. Because if you own property in, Lon- in, in, in America via a British Virgin Islands company, it both was and wasn't in America simultaneously. It was in America for the benefit purpose of all the things that are good about America, like a dynamic economy and a good currency. But it wasn't in America for the purpose of the things that are bad about America, like high taxes or or strict regulations. So this is what offshore does for you, is it means you can pick and choose which bits of a country you want to, to obey. And so Britain created this system offshore, which basically allows someone in America or Russia or Nigeria or any country um, who likes certain things about their country, like being able to steal stuff or or earn money or whatever, but doesn't like other things, like having to obey certain laws, they essentially get to opt out of which laws they don't like by employing clever London bankers or accountants or lawyers who can essentially arrange that for them. And that's what I call butlering. And and there are infinite examples of this happening in infinite places in the world. And the challenge writing the book was trying to come up with just, or trying to limit the examples I wrote, because this book could have been, you know, a million pages long, because this is what Britain's been doing for 60 years. Um, and so it was a, yeah, it was a it was a fascinating challenge trying to find a way of telling this story in a simple, accessible manner, which also would be relatively short. Because the problem is, once I get the bit between my teeth, I can keep going forever on this nonsense. It's just it's yeah. endlessly fascinating to watch the astonishing amount of effort that very clever people will put into helping other people break the rules. It's incredible. You know, if you think about, you know, the the laborious you know, really detailed granular work that was required to design the mechanisms that were used to allow these people to break the rules. It's just extraordinary. The butlering, it's not its not easy. They put the hours in, you know. I think the, the corruption side of it is very interesting because I was discussing this with my mum yesterday. She, she was uh, talking about Nawaz Sharif, who was, I think, uh, Pakistani prime minister and now is in exile, I think, in the United Kingdom or in London or something. And it's living in this really nice house in Knightsbridge and all, all this stuff. And how they get given these cards and they're given these, what, what you, t- I think it's the term, are they gold visas? These these visas golden, that are given to special... Visas. Yeah. golden visas yeah for, for special elite people uh that can bypass the visa system but you also gave a really good example in the book where you talked about uh, the nigerians and you said that when they fall sick uh, they get airlifted to britain so there's like two there's there's two versions of people in each country those that can afford to come to britain and those who, who can't which i think is very interesting exactly i mean that was a that example of the nigerian elite is a really interesting one that hadn't occurred to me at all the idea that you have not just offshore finance and law and property, but also off- offshore healthcare. In that, if you are a Nigerian, an ordinary Nigerian, healthcare is pretty ropey. You know, the the average um, Nigerian, the average Nigerian, the spend by the government on the healthcare of the average Nigerian is about eleven US dollars a year, which is not nearly enough to provide the services they require, um, particularly considering that, you know, the, the the real health complications caused by epidemic diseases like malaria and so on. So, you know, really, there should be a lot more money being spent just to secure basic healthcare services. Um, but if you are an, a Nigerian government official, you don't worry about that, because you just come to London, and you get treated here in London. And it was a really fascinating insight when COVID struck and suddenly international travel was frozen, that all these people who all their medical records were in in, on Harley Street in London in in private clinics or or possibly in in Berlin where they have some private clinics as well, but mainly in London. Um, And they had all these private hospitals that that they couldn't get to anymore and they were having to rely on on the hospitals in, in Nigeria. And that it was a really interesting example of like you say, you know, most people have to make do with what's available. But if you can afford it, you can just come to London. Um, And the same is true um, of legal services. 
you know, Russian oligarchs have made a um, a real habit of ruining the courts and the criminal system in Russia because they don't want independent courts. They want courts that will be rigged in their favour. So if they have a a dispute with a, with a, a rival or, or or anyone, they know the court will do what it's told and will decide in their favour. Um, but there are times when they want there to be a proper independent court that will actually decide a case on its merits. You know, if two really big oligarchs are going head to head with each other, you know, they don't want to, you know, they're probably as rich as each other. They don't want to bankrupt themselves by paying bribes when, you know, they can both essentially outbribe each other indefinitely. You know, that would be no good at all. So what do you do? Well, they come to London and they do their case in the commercial courts and they hire all these astonishingly good and competent British lawyers. And there are these good, honest British judges and they decide the case. And then the oligarchs decide, you know, yes, that's good. That case is decided. And then they can go home and start exploiting the dishonest courts in order to rip off everyone else. So you have, you know, good health care for people who can afford it, good courts for people who can afford it, and good housing for people who can afford it. And they depri- they deny their fellow citizens of all of these things um, because they're able to do it, because, you know, there's no downside to them. Um, and it's mm. and it's a really troubling thought. If you look around the world at so many of the problems that, that the world has, they're essentially a consequence of the fact that we allow the elites of whole countries by offering them our world-class butlering services, we allow the elites of whole countries to essentially opt out of being citizens of those countries. They, you know, it, it used to be Britain that was colonizing the world, but now it's almost like the elites of countries are colonizing their own nations and bringing the money here. You know, it used to be that mm. we colonized the world and brought the money here, but now it's the elites of countries, that, that, but they still bring the money here. It's kind of like we we get the money, whatever happens. And, um, you know, we might not get quite as much of it as we used to, but we still seem to get a decent quantity. I think the troubling thing is that a lot of people might look at other countries and, and criticise the level of corruption without realising that, like, I think in the book you give the example of Boris Johnson getting questioned on some level of corruption, I think, related to Russian oligarchs and him dismissing it or, or not particularly answering the question. And I think that tells a lot about the institutionalised nature of the the corruption would you determine it as being corruption from a from a butlering point of view like how do you define it is it corruption or is it just at this stage so institutionalized that it's just part of the fabric of of how we do business i mean it's a really troubling question really gets to the heart of the this issue and i think it's one of the reasons why it's been so hard for people in the west to understand what's happening with our own enabling of bad behavior by oligarchs from all over the world because the, the most i mean the most well known anti corruption organization transparency international has been studying corruption for decades now and they have this you know well known definition of corruption which is that the the abuse of entrusted power for private gain um which is a perfectly good description of what oligarchs do, right? Or government officials do in somewhere like Russia or Nigeria or Ukraine. You know, they are a government minister and they're supposed to be working on behalf of the people, but instead they use their power to steal from the people. And, you know, that makes perfect sense when you think about it like that. And that is the the basis on which Transparency International publishes its Corruption Perceptions Index, which is a famous, you know, annual index in which every country in the world is given a score um, as to how corrupt it is. And they produce this, this map, uh, which different countries are, you know, rated, you get different colour. If you're very corrupt, you get a sort of angry red colour. And if you're not corrupt, you get a nice friendly yellow colour. So you see this map where, you know, Europe is yellow, Australia's yellow, Japan's yellow, and then other countries, America's yellow, and other countries are different shades of red. And then you get down into sort of sub-Saharan Africa, and it's this very angry red. And then, you know, the Middle East is just a bit red. And, um, and yet, if you look, if you look at the the list of countries, you know, you'll see, say, Ukraine or Russia are kind of down the bottom, and at the top, you know, you have places like Denmark or Sweden. And yet, if you look at the biggest money laundering scandal of recent years, Danske Bank, Sweden's biggest bank, moved two hundred billion euros on behalf of Russians and Ukrainians and Azeris and others from the former Soviet Union under the cover of British shell companies. So you've got. The money came from the countries right down the bottom. 
And yet it was moved under the cover of a Danish bank at the top and British shell companies also at the top. So how come they're corrupt and we're not? That's the question, because because corruption isn't it's not like football. It's not you can't compare different countries, national teams. It's not like the, the, the most 11 corrupt people from Ukraine are facing off against the most 11 corrupt people from Britain and whoever wins gets higher on the ranking. You know, corruption involves British people and Ukrainians and Danes. So why is it all dumped on the Ukrainians or the Russians or the Nigerians and not also dumped on us? Because we're equally to blame. The way we're looking at it, it's like we're only penalising the person who takes the bribe and not the person who pays the bribe. It's a, you know, it's a bit like studying, you know, the, the drugs trade and only, only, you know, criticising. Well, actually, this is exactly what happens criticizing countries that produce the drugs and not the countries that consume the drugs, right? I mean, it, it's totally yeah, yeah. analogous. You know, you say we're going to blame Colombia and not the United States or, or you know, blame Afghanistan and not the UK. Um, it's totally analogous. But the essentially we, our own role, we've chosen not to define as corrupt. Um, mm. You know, but... Is that, but is that because... Sorry to interrupt you, but is that because in the book you talk about how how difficult it is to track it and how under-resourced the institutions that are supposed to be investigating it are in the UK. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's a, it's a bit chicken and egg in that regard, because I think if we had a better recognition of how corruption works, we would probably put more effort into tracking and investigating and prosecuting it. And if we put more effort into tracking, investigating and prosecuting it, we'd have a better understanding of how corruption works. You know, and the two the two problems feed on each other but but essentially you know it's a very profitable misunderstanding you know our failure to look into this is making a you know a decent number of people in our country quite a lot of money so you know i i mean i'm never there's this sort of debate about can you explain a situation is it corruption or incompetence right this is always this sort of dichotomy corruption versus incompetence but I actually think there's a third option and I don't really I don't have a, a like a a nice snappy term for it but it's a situation that's sufficiently profitable to a sufficiently large number of people that there's no real reason to change it and I think that that's what you know we've ended up in this situation where because you know the invention of the butler industry back in 1956 it was totally accidental this wasn't no one designed this they they didn't start using dollars because that you know it was this amazing nefarious James Bond villain-esque plan to undermine the entire global financial system. They only did it because they desperately needed to fund trade and to stay in business. And, and, and once they'd started doing it, they realized what the, the possibilities were. And, and it's a little bit like this with the, the misuse of British shell companies. We didn't design our company's house to have this giant glaring loophole in it that meant that it was incredibly easy to hide laundered money behind a Scottish limited partnership. That was totally accidental. Some money launderer discovered it. Um, but having discovered it, um, no one was in a hurry to close the loophole because it was making enough people enough money. Um, so I think that's the situation. Essentially, we're very good at pointing the finger at foreigners and telling them they're corrupt um, and not very good at listening when they say in return, you know what, actually, why don't you why don't you have a bit of a look at what you, you're doing? Um, and mm. and yeah, and that, and I think that's the, the reality of it, really. You're, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I wrote a piece in the in the, uh, one of the newspapers the other day, which got a bit of attention um, uh, because I, I said that, you know, Britain's role in for, to Russia is, is like, is like Florida was to Al Capone. You're, you know, you're, because, you know, Chicago was a, was a great place to steal money in the 1930s, right? You know, um, it, particularly if you were a big mobster, but, but it was cold and kind of violent and dangerous. Whereas Florida was lovely and warm and, and, and had great restaurants and was very you know, open and, and mm. hospitable. That's kind of the situation. You know, re, you know, Russia, though wonderful in many ways, is also cold and, and, and uncomfortable and, and all that. Whereas London, look at it. It's got great schools and great hospitals and great houses and great restaurants and great art galleries and, and great shops. Uh, it's a nice time zone, receptive lawyers very hospitable politicians it's got everything which an oligarch needs so so you know we are the mob bankers to the mob you know they they and and it's a really uncomfortable place to be in and and, and a but but something that we really kind of need to come to terms with mm. it would be great to get your take on the current situation with what's happening with Ukraine and Russia and the fresh sanctions that 
countries have been putting on Russia, and it seems like everyone's putting pressure on them from countries to uh, international corporations. It seems like everyone's sort of boycotting them and boycotting their services to them. So it'd be great to get your take on whether that will be enough or whether uh, Britain's Britain's role in that, Britain's role in, in answering that difficult question about how they're facilitating uh, Russian uh, soft power, uh, if you want to call it that, with their oligarchs and, and such. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's never too late to do the right thing. And I think sanctioning Putin for what he's doing in Ukraine is the right thing. I think what he's doing is is pretty unforgivable, really. Um, and it's good that Western countries are taking it seriously and acting accordingly. However, um, for a long time, decades, actually, Britain, it's almost like Britain has had two foreign policies. Um it's had a foreign policy run by the Foreign Office, which has been, you know, we, we're very determined to support democracy and encourage, you know, state institutions and send aid to people who need it and do all these wonderful, right, you know, lovely things that we do. While simultaneously, you know, in a different part of government, in the Treasury and the Business Department and so on, there's been a separate foreign policy, which is to encourage as much money to come to the UK as possible, no matter who owns it. And I don't think even now there is sufficient realisation that these two foreign policies are in direct contradiction with each other. You can't, in all good conscience, claim to be supporting democracy in places like Ukraine while simultaneously providing a safe haven for the wealth of people who are destroying democracy in Ukraine. And yet that's what we've been doing. And we've been doing it for absolutely ages. Um, and that is the difficulty that the government is suddenly up against, which is that, you know, I think the half of the government's brain that is the, for, the first foreign policy desperately wants to do something about what Putin is up to and to punish him for his unprovoked aggression against the Ukrainians and to make sure that his, you know, oligarchs really learn a lesson that they can't support a man who does this kind of thing. But simultaneously... Mm -hmm. The other half of the government's brain wants to make sure that in taking these measures, no harm is done to the clients of Butler Britain who might find themselves out of pocket. And, and you end up with this very incoherent response as a result, because there is no state capacity to do the things the government says it wants to do, because they've been just run down if they were ever run up in the first place. And so it, it's a little bit like asking well, me, I suppose, someone who, you know, who, who who's never been in a fight in his life to suddenly go, you know, 10 rounds in the ring with a heavyweight boxer. You, you need to be in training beforehand. You need to have some training. You need to have some skill. You need to have the right nutrition, all of these things. You know, whereas our law enforcement services, you know, they're like the five stone weakling up against the, the heavyweight boxer who's, who doesn't have, they haven't had the right resources. They haven't had the right people. They haven't had the right tools for the job. You know, and they're really under motivated because, you know, if you're a halfway competent law enforcement investigator, after three or four years of realizing that you're just going to keep losing, you just leave and go and work for a compliance department for a bank because you get paid twice as much. And why not? Probably half the hours. So it's a it's a pretty difficult situation for those of us who really hope that the government will actually do something worthwhile, because even though they're saying the right thing, um, and you know, let's take at face value what they're saying and and say assume that they mean what they're saying um they're not really capable of doing what they say they want to do because the government just yeah. don't have the capacity to do it and how, where does it come from an, an aspect of for instance the the awareness of it because i think awareness is a very interesting one but um, I think there is some of a dichotomy between that. Like I, I heard Boris Johnson talking about it and talking about how he supports sort of Ukrainian freedom and he supports um, like deterring or, or, or calling down Putin. And I thought that the same thing as you, I thought it was very interesting that he's calling someone out, yet there are many oligarchs who are currently sitting in London and they're facing fresh sanctions and they're sitting there thinking, well, what did we do? You, you allowed us here like a week ago and we were fine. Now we're not. In 2020, um, Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee published a report into Russian interference in the UK, which it had been compiling 
with evidence from our security services and law enforcement agencies for the previous year. Um, in fact, the report was finished um, towards the end of summer 2019, uh, just around the time when Boris Johnson first became prime minister. Um, and he refused to allow it to be published. He came up with various justifications for it. And then he only allowed it to be published after the election. And then the committee had to be reformed. And so it didn't come out, didn't come out. When it was finally published, and you, you can read it, it's available on, on online. You just can just Google the internet in the ISC and Russia report, and it'll probably be the first hit that comes up. Um, it's a very sober and considered piece of work analysing, you know, Putin's intentions towards the UK, looking at things like cybersecurity and financial security, you know, lots of uh, uh, counter espionage, lots of, you know, different aspects. And it really requires from a I think a, from a government's perspective, a very sober analysis, because it's pretty alarming about, you know, capacity being run down and all these kind of things. And Boris Johnson's response was just, he, he said it was an attempt by Islingtonian Remainers to delegitimize Brexit, which is bizarre because it only mentions Brexit like twice, I think, in the whole report. Um, it's not really about Brexit. In any, I mean, it's quite a long report. It's very odd. <laughs> and you know, this is quite clearly a man who had absolutely no intention of grappling with the knotty issue of Russian money in the UK. Um, he just grabbed a soundbite to, to get rid of the argument, knowing very well that, that you know, that was a weak spot for, you know, Labour who were trying to, you know, avoid the, the reputation for being Remainers at the time. And, and, and that was it. And, and no one talks about it again. Um, and yet now, you know, I mean, as we speak, in fact, Parliament is debating an economic crime bill um, in a hurry. They're going to have to pass the whole thing in one day in a, in a desperate rush, which is something that was recommended by that report as something that should have happened. It's something that had been recommended by previous reports as something that should have happened. It could have been brought in in a considered, careful manner to make sure that there were no flaws in the legislation. But they didn't do it. They just rejected it out of hand as it, the, the, the moaning of Islingtonian remainers. And now they're sort of desperately trying to do it. Too, it's too late. It won't really do any good. And, and it's being done in a hurry. So it probably have, have mistakes in. So it's just indicative of, of well, of a government that, that prioritises Russian oligarchs over, you know, their victims. You know, and, and it's worth bearing in mind just because it still amazes me that Yevgeny Lebedev, the son of the former KGB station chief in London, is a member of the House of Lords. It's the Baron of Siberia. That still amazes me. You know, it seems so incredible that any government should have done that, that, you know, it does, again, it just shows fairly clearly that the priority has always been to make things comfortable as possible for the wealthy and to spend very little, if any time, wondering where their money came from. Yeah, you gave a really, really good example in the book uh, with Dmitry Firtash, um, yeah, and he was a close story. friend of, of. Yeah, it was a really, really interesting story, and and uh, <laughs> I thought that I thought that uh, that amusement uh, of the old train uh, tube station would have been really interesting. I probably would have gone wouldn't to it, it but wouldn't it be <laughs> cool? I mean, so yeah, Ajit, Ajit it would Chambers, Ajit Chambers is. I think he 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 was. And he, he had this fabulous idea. I mean, most people won't be aware of him because, but he, Ajit Chambers was a was a former banker who had this great idea to, to basically take over the disused tube stations, of which there are a handful in London. He said there were 40. There aren't actually 40, but there's a, a, a few. And to turn them into tourist attractions when you could kind of go down to the platform and there'd be like holograms and it's, you know, and they'd have parties. And, and actually, I do know, I know someone who went to a party in that tube station when he was when he was running it as a sort of proof of concept thing. And it would have been super cool um, uh, as a sort of offbeat tourist attraction. But instead of that, um, the government sold the old tube station to this guy, Dmitry Firtash, who was the, um, you know, Putin's man in Ukraine, the man who, who, who represented Putin's gas company in Ukraine, who who had, you know, managed to essentially by the, his use of his control over gas shipments had managed to 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 break up the 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 democratic democratic coalition in Ukraine and bring back the kleptocrat Viktor Yanukovych who caused so many problems and in fact in a way led to the current crisis that there is at the moment um and there've been all these warnings about 
Dmitry Firtash and who he was and who he was friends with, you know, his his supposed ties, which he, he consistently denied, but which, you know, kept coming up anyway to a, to a, a very notorious mobster called Simeon Magalevich. And, you know, he, like I say, he, he denied it, but it was still an alarming thing, the idea that you're selling someone who, who's even been reported, in, you know, in, in legitimate news, newspapers as being connected to a mobster, you're selling him a tube station is an alarming thing to do. Um, and he wasn't just sold a tube station. He, he got to meet the, the Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burke, who he opened trading at the London Stock Exchange. He, he got to meet Prince Philip. He was um, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, that is. He he, he was uh, on, brought into the Guild of Benefactors of Cambridge University because he, he gave them a lot of money. He bought himself a mansion uh, right next door to the tube station for £60 million. Pounds. Yeah, he really did become accepted into the bosom of the British establishment in no uncertain terms. Um, and then literally, what, two weeks after the, the deal to sell the tube station closed, um, the Americans indicted him on corruption charges. And ever since he's been battling extradition to the United States. And it, it, it's I, I think of, of all the stories in the book, it's the one that reveals this incredible disconnect between our attitude to money, of just money, any money, you know, bring it in, wherever money it is. We're not going to ask whose it is, just bring it in. You know, we'll, we'll sell you stuff. To say the Americans or others who 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 have you know potent law enforcement agencies that are able and willing to investigate where money comes from and to bring these cases um, to try and you know prosecute corruption wherever they can find it and that is so different to what happens in this country you know the difference between being indicted by the FBI and being introduced to the Duke of Edinburgh I mean that's those two things could hardly be further <laughs> apart. Polar opposites. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> and you know, and and the tragedy in a way, like one of the reasons why that story makes me sad is that you know, Ajit Chambers had this great idea for Brompton Road Tube Station. It would have been super cool. It instead of him buying it, it went to Dmitry Firtash. But Dmitry Firtash ever since has been in Vienna battling extradition to the United States. So the tube station has never been anything. It's just it's just empty. It's it. You know, it could have been all this time. It could have been a super cool tourist attraction. And instead, it's just empty as it was when he bought it. It was an office building, you know, and, and it's still an office building. And, and, and that's just a real shame. And that um, I think that that tendency of, of you know, a tendency in London in particular to sell properties to people who are not going to use them. They're just using them as a, as a safety deposit box, you know, as a store of value instead of a house. You know, if you... You know, if you walk around those areas of West London that have been really colonised by oligarchs in a big way, you know, Eaton Square or, you know, Belgravia, all around there, um, you know, the, the houses look lovely and everything looks smart and beautiful, but it's really striking. You know, there are no shops, right? There are no pubs because there's no people. So so all the businesses that rely on there being people go bust. It, you know, it's not a neighbourhood anymore. Um, and, and you know, I think that, that that's a sort of in, in a small way, it's indicative of of a real hollowing out of our country that's been caused by this butlering. You know, when you're when you're essentially selling the services of a country to people who, who are not they're not interested in the country as a nice place or or a place to contribute to or a place to form a community in. They're just interested in what it can offer them. You know, what what you know what what are you selling? Or oh, we'll sell you a visa, we'll sell you legal services. They're not here because they want to go to the pub or go to the shop or have a chat with their neighbours. You know, they're here because they want it's transactional, you know. And that's really different, you know, to 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 immigrants who come here and 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 you know because they want to work and live and muck in and send their kids to school and have a good time. You know, it's a it's a totally different kind of immigration, and I think it's a real shame that you know the government has been encouraging the immigration of oligarchs who who all they want is you know what can Britain sell them, you know, and and discouraging the immigration of people who could who would really contribute and enrich society in, in wonderful ways. I mean, it's indicative. Uh, you know, at, at the moment, if you look at, you know, Ukrainian refugees trying to come to Britain, what the, the latest figure is that we've been incredibly generous and, and let in 50 people. You know, it, 50, it's, yeah, um, I saw that. 50, you know, exactly. You know, if only they were multimillionaires, we'd have sold them visas. That would have been fine, you know. And that's just, yeah, it's yeah. just indicative of, of the situation over the years that, that you know, we, we, we keep out, you know, we keep out the people who might actually enrich the country while, while letting in oligarchs who, who you know, frankly, have going to do nothing but fleece us really i mean they're oligarchs right they don't stop being oligarchs just because they've got off the plane at heathrow they're you know they're the same people they want the same stuff they want they want preferential access to our courts and they want to be able to muzzle the media they want to be able to 
you know, talk around our politicians. They want to avoid, you know, answering to the law. All the things that oligarchs want in Russia, they still want the same things here. Yeah, I think uh, you, it's interesting for those that don't know, you do this something called, I think, the kleptocracy tours where you show yeah. people around uh, these these houses and you actually people give people an indication about all these uh, all these apartments and houses in London in the places that you're talking about, whether it be Eaton Square or Belgravia, that are just completely abandoned and that no one's even living in there. And I think people need to know because, you know, house prices in London are ridiculously expensive. And I think in it, everywhere, to be honest, that they're increasing very quickly. And it's it's a real shame that the government doesn't really do more considering that that is the case. Yeah, I mean, the... the... The original idea for the kleptocracy tours was they came from my friend Roman Borisovich, who's a <laughs> Russian-born um, uh, guy who became very concerned about corruption. He works with Alexei Navalny, the Russian anti-corruption activist. And he came up with this idea, and it's, it's modelled on um, yeah, the Hollywood tours. You know, the, um, you know, you get to go in a bus yeah. around Hollywood and you get to see where the film stars live or used to live or whatever. It's a very simple idea. It was, it's great. And it's really fun. And and the idea is essentially to be able to prevent people being able to say they didn't know, right? Because, because you know, it's easy to say, oh, oh we didn't know the oligarch's wealth was here. We had no idea. Oh, if only we'd known, we'd have done something about that, you know? And the idea bit would, we'd put people in a bus and drive them around and say, no, that house, that belongs to this oligarch and that house belongs to that Nigerian regional governor and that house belongs to this, you know, the, the son of the Egyptian president and that house belongs to you know, the, the son of one of Putin's oldest friends and whatever. You just go around. That house belongs to a member of the Russian parliament, you know, and 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 you tell the story of the money and how the person earned the money or got the money and how, how they bought the house. And, you know, it in London, it, it you know, obviously the traffic isn't great, so it takes a while to drive around. And, you know, we normally would only cover like five or six properties in an afternoon. But, but you know, it was enough. It, it really, you know, managed to get the message over that this is a, this is a city that has laid out the red carpet to suspicious wealth and for, for the longest time. And, um, and, and I think they, you know, they, they did help change the conversation. I mean, you know, we haven't, we haven't actually, I mean, nothing's actually changed, right? I mean, kleptocracy hasn't gone anywhere. London's still doing it, but I think that there are now more people who are aware of it than there were. And it's certainly debated much more in parliament and among politicians than it used to be about essentially the moral aspect and the, and the security aspect, to be honest, about um, allowing people with suspicious fortunes to just come and lord it up in our country and enjoy, you know, the protection of our laws and, and, and enjoy, you know, while they loot the schools at home, send their kids to private schools here and loot the hospitals at home and send, you know, go to hospitals here and so on. You know, there is, there's, there's, a, there's a moral argument to it, as well as a security and economic argument. Mm. And I think that that is increasingly recognised that, that being a butler is a pretty unconscionable way of making a living. Yeah, it definitely is. I think that you can't, like you said earlier, you can't promote freedom and democracy on, on one hand and then allow people to then do the the thing that you're contradicting in your own country, in your own backyard. Yeah, there was this extraordinary moment in 2016 when David Cameron was prime minister and he actually, he was, you know, on this one issue um, of, of kleptocracy, he was quite good, probably the best prime minister there's been i mean i'm not making any judgment about all the other things he did but just on this one particular very niche issue he was very good and and before um he had a, a summit to discuss corruption and what to do about it and beforehand he referred to to nigeria as fantastically corrupt um in a i think in, he was a conversation with the queen and i think he was overheard and they asked the nigerian president what he thought about the fact that david cameron called him fantastically corrupt and, and he said yes it's true we do have a problem with corruption but he can call me what he likes as long as they return our money to us. And, um, you know, and, you know, in Nigeria, they know very well where the money is. They're not they're not foolish. They, you know, they, they know the money is here. In Russia, they know the money is here. Ukraine, the money is here. They know that you know, in Malaysia, they know the money is here. You know, who are we fooling? Right. Because because it's only it's only British people who don't realize what we're up to. Everyone else knows. So, um, yeah, yeah. you know, and so that is a. You know, I suppose the idea of the book Butler to the World is just to try and make more people aware of of, of what we've been doing. Um, you know, and it, it goes beyond oligarchs. It isn't I mean at the moment oligarchs are the subject at the moment, obviously, but you know, it, it, there's all sorts of, of alarming consequences. I mean, that you know, I write about the offshore gambling industry, which is really disturbing yeah. 
Um, and and you know, and and again, I mean, that was that, that's largely run out of Gibraltar, uh, which is weird because people don't think of Gibraltar think of it as just a naval base. You don't think of it as being a big gambling haven like Las Vegas or something. Um, you know, and so there's much more to it. it it's uh, it's the tentacles of this sort of butlering industry um, go very deeply into all aspects of, of of what Britain gets up to, and it is going to be hard to 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 get out of that game because so many people make so much money out of it. Yeah, so I think that would be a great place to end. So just talk about where do you think it's going to go or what necessary steps you think are needed to change it or whether it's going to be a gradual change or you see something like a massive event, perhaps like the one we're seeing now, be the one that perhaps turns the tide. I mean, I think what's happening now with Russia and Ukraine is helping to to make politicians realise that Russian oligarchs shouldn't have had such free run of the city. Um, uh, and Well, not just the home counties as well. I mean, the southeast of England specifically, which is good. Yeah. Um, you know, better late than never. I suppose what I'm concerned about is there doesn't seem to be a knock-on realisation that, that other oligarchs are bad too, right? You know, the, these oligarchs that we're currently so worried about, we weren't worried about them a month ago. We were only worried about them yeah. because Putin's invaded Ukraine, but they're the same people. They earned their wealth in exactly the same way. Um, they behaved in the same way back then as they do now. Um, so, you know, if you look at the the volume of money that's come here, there's far more money has come here from China than in than has from from Russia. In fact, I, I you know I, a contact of mine, a very sort of small scale oligarch who's who's based here, um, it was said to me sort of slightly facetiously, but not entirely. Like, Why are you so worried about the Russians? You know, look at what we buy. You know, we buy football clubs and posh cars and stuff we just buy toys look what the chinese buy they buy ports and nuclear power stations you know you should be worried about them and and i mean i think he probably had a point actually um yeah you know, we, definitely we defi- does. yeah we definitely should be worried about them but it, but you know i worry that we'll only worry about them after the fact you know we'll wait until a crisis has blown over then we'll then we'll be rushing through legislation and like we are today i mean this is what we're talking about is a is a criminal issue this money it's yeah you know, this is like mafia crimes um it's not. Uh, it's something that needs to be dealt with patiently and carefully, with investigation by law enforcement agents over years, and they gradually build cases and prosecute people. And that's how you deal with a criminal issue. You don't deal with it by having a sudden panic and everyone running around, you know, screaming and shouting for a bit, and then going back to business as usual. That's not how you do it. So my concern about this crisis is that. This crisis is being discussed as a Russia crisis, not as an oligarchy crisis, when really it has been an absolutely crucial backstop to Putin's regime that his oligarchs have been able to keep so much of their wealth outside the country. You know, they've been able they've been able to mismanage Russia, to allow its institutions to 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 decline, to allow its you know, infrastructure to decline, to have its courts just be corrupted because they know that their wealth is safe. You know, they, they've got, you know, for them, essentially the mismanagement of Russia is a spectator sport because, you know, it's not going to affect the cost of their super yachts or their Picassos or their football clubs or their or their townhouses in Eaton Square or whatever. Um, so, you know, the role that Britain has played as the butler to Russian oligarchs has allowed those Russian oligarchs to do all the, everything that they've done. And so that's kind of on us. And and I hope that 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 this crisis will allow us to realise that, that this isn't just Russia behaving badly. We've also behaved badly. You know, it, you, you, it takes two people to be corrupt. And, um, and you know, if we don't recognise our own role in that, then we won't have learned the right lesson from this crisis. Yeah, definitely. And I think that that awareness that I think we've been discussing from an, a citizen point of view is really important because, like I said, I think more people are becoming aware about how, uh, institutionalized Russian oligarchs are from the crisis because there's a lot of articles about uh, sanctions on those oligarchs and I think more and more people are getting awareness from them which I think is going to put pressure on politicians as well like you said. Well, that's that, that's the hope that's the hope but I hope it doesn't stop with Russian oligarchs and they start looking at you know Azeri oligarchs, Kazakh oligarchs, you know Chinese oligarchs, just oligarchs from everywhere, British oligarchs right I mean just let's just not have oligarchs. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's scrap the oligarch then. yeah let's, i think let's, that's uh exactly 
<laughs> that's the that's the main takeaway from our conversation. Anyway, Oliver, thank you so much. For, thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast and discussing your your new book, uh, Butler to the World, uh, right here. Um, the book is coming out in the UK on the seventeenth of March, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Uh, actually, I think it's come forward a week. I think it's no, I think it's on the tenth. Oh, it's on the tenth. Oh, okay, we've brought it. We've, I think we've I think we have brought it forward in time. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, where's the best place that individuals can find you, whether it be uh, a website or, or any social media? Uh, I'd like to say you couldn't find me on Twitter, but I'm afraid f- far too much time, <laughs> far too much time. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, yeah, Twitter, I don't do the others. I'm not on the other socials, but yeah, too much time on Twitter. So if you want to, okay. uh, but I, I run a newsletter every week called Oligarchy, which I link to on Twitter as well. Um, and I write lots of articles all over the shop. Perfect. I'll, I'll put the links to, to both of those in the description below so people can check them out and send you any questions if they have any. Great. Okay. Thank you. Nice Thank you for coming on, Oliver. That's my pleasure. Cheers. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Hopefully you found this podcast really interesting about how Britain has become butler to the world. And hopefully it's giving you some education because I don't think many people know uh, how Britain serves uh, these individuals, uh, these nefarious individuals. And hopefully listening to this podcast has inspired you to read the book or read more widely about it and specifically Oliver's work because I know he spent a lot of time and effort writing about the subject and I know he's very passionate about exposing this and getting people more well onto the subject so definitely recommend picking up his new book butler to the world i'll put the link in the description below so if you want to buy the book off amazon then we'll get a kickback as well for the podcast which helps support the channel as well i'll put his links as well to his twitter and to his newsletter in the description below as well so you can check that out Just a reminder to subscribe to the podcast. Every week we release a podcast with an author to discuss their book and the ideas and principles inside of it. Like I've mentioned, we've got some really exciting podcast episode lined up over the coming weeks and months. So I definitely recommend subscribing, whether you listen to this on Apple, Spotify or YouTube. And the best thing that you can do is head over to our YouTube channel, Book Talk Today and subscribe there. There you can listen and watch the video of the podcast as well. If you're listening to this on Apple and Spotify or other streaming services obviously you you can't watch the video actually i think on spotify you can watch the video but on obviously an apple you can't so if you'd like to watch the video then you can head over to that channel as well thank you again for listening to the podcast and i look forward to seeing you in the next episode